Good morning, good morning. It is sad to say, but there are currently ongoing wars in around three dozen countries, most of them in the Middle East, Northwest Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and there are major ongoing drug wars, of course, in South America and Mexico. Wikipedia lists around 40 ongoing wars and conflicts with over 100 combat deaths in 2020 and 2021. We are fortunate to have with us today Lawrence Wilkerson, who will lead us in a discussion titled The Warfare State. Lawrence Wilkerson just recently retired as the Distinguished Visiting Professor of Government and Public Policy at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. He also taught for six years in the University Honors Program at the George Washington University in Washington, DC. Lawrence Wilkerson's last positions in government were as Secretary of State Colin Powell's Chief of Staff and Associate Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff under the directorship of Ambassador Richard Haas. Before serving in the State Department, he served 31 years in the US Army, including as Deputy Executive Officer of the then General Colin Powell when he commanded the US Army Forces Command. Colonel Wilkinson was Special Assistant to General Powell when he was Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was Director of the US Marine Corps War College in Quantico, Virginia. Let us welcome Lawrence Wilkerson and the Warfare State. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. And let me do something that I normally never do in spoken remarks, and that is read a text. But I'm not going to read it for the entire time. In fact, I hear the, uh, the cues out there. I want to read you something that I hand out to my students and have handed out to my students for some time at both universities that were just cited. And this is sort of a scene setter for what is normally called case studies in power in my public policy curriculum and national security decision making in my undergraduate curriculum. This is what my students read. And then in the first seminar, we ponder and talk about and throughout the next 14 seminars as well. For national security scholars, the history of the United States can usefully be divided into two periods. The years after the break from Britain, say 1789 or so, to 1947, and the years from that seminal year to the present. It is a helpful distinction because it divides republic from empire. Today, there is another year of note, 2001. After that year, the empire began to totter and crumble. Ironically, Osama bin Laden, the ascetic leader of the terrorist group who supposedly carried out those attacks, and I use supposedly only to give some credence to other theories. I don't personally subscribe to them. I think he did carry them out. But if you read, read his fatwas, you find out that his ultimate purpose was just what I described. In short, not by the march of strong armies would empires, particularly ours, be brought down, but by their own devices. A formulation familiar to such Americans as disparate as John Adams and Abraham Lincoln, both of whom made similar statements. Evaluating several important signs of the diminishing power of this imperial state, we can conclude that this process of tottering and collapse is well underway. Both public and private debt at astronomical proportions, wealth massively maldistributed, in fact, very much so beyond 1929 proportions. And we also know what happened following that seminal year. A marked inability to govern ourselves, Christian nationalism in a third great awakening, if you will, 
violence in the streets of major metropolises, a less than, uh, uh, shall I say, savory character in the last four years, minus a few months, in the White House, economic, political, or actual warfare being waged, and economic warfare is what it is under international law, and we're waging it against 3.6 billion people through principally sanctions. Whether this imperial decline that I've just barely enumerated will consume 100 years as this empire unravels or be over tomorrow is an important question. A precipitous decline might dismember the state and shock much of the world. A slow retreat from hegemonic power might allow for the orchestration of a gentle glide into a lesser statehood, call it primus inter pares, call it peris inter pares, but a more peaceful and a more equitably prosperous world. The man recently in the White House, whom I mentioned earlier, seemed to have intuited these equitable, these developments, and in some inexplicable and inexplicable and often ambiguous ways, aimed his policies at either arresting or accommodating them. Footnote. This is an addition, of course, to the principal paper I handed out before Trump became president. Thus far, however, the overall question still hangs in the air. Which is it to be? Almost instant, perhaps cataclysmic death or a mellow maturation, not unlike the one the British Empire went through from say 1890 to 1956 when the United States had clearly replaced it in terms of overall power. The national question or this national question is accompanied by a global one, how the human race will confront both an out of control nuclear arms situation and ultimately climate change, both existential challenges. These questions are the truly vital ones of this still young century it is well worth time to explore them. End of paper, and of course, that is what we do for 13 of 14 seminars. I want to focus today on one dimension, as was indicated in the title, the warfare state, or as I call it euphemistically somewhat, the national security state, which simply means a republic focused more than anything else, and all you have to do is look at the physical focus to understand that, on its own security. Remember what Benjamin Franklin said, those who trade their liberty for security shall have neither. When we look at this, the first thing, as I indicated, we wanna look at is how much are we spending of our taxpayer wealth on this warfare state? It's astronomical if you look at it a different way than the Congress and the Pentagon in particular like for you to look at it. And I like to call this the national security budget rather than the Pentagon's budget or the defense budget or the military budget, all of which are misleading. The national security budget includes homeland security. It includes, which is around 50 billion now, it includes the Pentagon, of course, at 715 to 720 billion. It includes the Veterans Administration, which the Pentagon deftly broke out from its own budget long time ago, knowing that were it to go into a warfare state continuum, it didn't want that money associated with its budget. It is now $243 billion and climbing and will continue to climb as the veterans from this 20 plus years of war multiply. Intelligence budget, some of it's dark, that is to say black, that is to say clandestine, secret, but we know it's somewhere north of 100 billion every year. The nuclear budget, which also was broken out and put in the Department of Energy, we know that's somewhere around 100 billion. The 150 account at state, the most deprived part of that national security budget, if you will, because basically it funds diplomacy, but it also funds things like international military education and training for countries who are basically run by dictators and use that money to oppress their own people as much as they do to fight communists in the past or to fight terrorists today, the ostensible purpose for awarding it. 
And then there's, as I said before, um, uh, the Homeland Security account, which I didn't cite in terms of money, but right now it's running about 49.8 billion plus 5 billion uh, for its uh, operational ready fund. So roughly 55 billion. Now, what is this in total? It's $1.3 trillion. Not three quarters of a trillion as people are constantly citing, not three and a half to 3.6% of the GDP. It's 6% of the GDP. It's 1.3 climbing towards $1.5 trillion. More than half of all discretionary federal spending by 2032, according to the CBO, more than half will be going to national security. That's an extraordinary thing to say because the other half is entitlements, that is fixed costs. So that means at that time, there will be no discretionary federal spending possible. And we're already 22, 22, 23 trillion in debt. We're already at almost 100% of GDP, if not beyond it. If we weren't lying, I think we would be beyond it. We're at World War II ending year, 1944-45, dimensions of debt, with no World War II to point back at and say, well, that's the reason, and we have such an incredible economic productive capacity as we did in 1945. The rest of the world was prostrate. We had 50% of the world's GDP. We have none of that to look back on. In fact, we have mostly its opposite. So that's the first dimension of the national security state that is truly, truly disconcerting. We look like Rome, if you will, and we look like Rome toward the end. Another factor that you could think about there is that Rome went away from the citizen soldier concept and went to mercenaries. Ask yourself what the all-volunteer force is today. The all-volunteer force, which comes from roughly 40% of your army, for example, comes from seven states, all of the old Confederacy. Alabama, with about 5 million total population, provides more recruits for my and your army than Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago, with an aggregate population of 30 million combined. We are making a military that is increasingly looking like it doesn't belong to America, or if it does, it belongs to those portions of America who have no other opportunity than the military, and that's why they go there. That's not totally the case, and it's not totally the case that they aren't motivated by patriotism, some of them anyway. But what we saw on 6 January at the Capitol and what we're seeing now and what Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin is dealing with and other leaders in the military are dealing with is everything from Christian nationalism to oath keepers, proud boys and so forth. And we Americans shrug our shoulders. And yet when you send people to kill for the state, to murder for the state, and they come back after two or three years of that, and many of them have been murdering not for freedom and democracy or even to counter terrorism, but for the predatory capitalist state that makes war machinery and needs to keep making war machinery. They're disturbed. They're not happy with that. All you need to do is read some of the books that Afghan and Iraq veterans have written like Eric Edstrom, a West Point graduate, whose book will just rip your heart out when you read it or a recent article he wrote in Politico that will rip your heart out in only 14 or 15 pages. So we have built an apparatus around this national security state, this warfare state, that is in, its, in and of itself, both directly and indirectly, threatening the empire, not securing it. And what about the wars? The wars on the periphery of the empire, the wars that we've been involved in now for almost 20 years or more than 20 years, really. If you go back to the no-fly zones in Iraq, almost 30 years, because we own the top one third and the bottom one third of Iraq and constantly had uh, exchange of weapons and fire in those no-fly zones. So look at that 30 years, that generation. And you understand why one student in a recent seminar, fall of 2020, when I was giving my opening spiel, so to speak, said, raised her hand and looked at me and said, Professor, do you know, I've never lived in a country that wasn't at war. She was absolutely right. And I thanked her for setting the scene even better than I could for the ensuing seminars. 
And then there's the economic sanctions. We are sanctioning 3.6 billion people in the world today, either their states or themselves or both. That's economic warfare. Take the blockade on Cuba, for example. Were Cuba a capable enough state to attack us, she would have every, every right under international law to do so. That embargo, that blockade, as they call it in Havana, has existed now for almost half a century. This is unconscionable what we're doing. It's unconscionable too what we're doing in Venezuela and other places that Americans simply don't know much about. And frankly, because of that, they don't care. We are sanctioning people in a way that under international law is warfare. And were these states whom we're sanctioning capable and China and Russia might be, we're seeing some of that right now in Ukraine, for example, or in the South China Sea, they'd be perfectly within their rights to attack us. That's one thing. Why are we in Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq and Venezuela and Russia and China and Ukraine and Libya and Mali and Chad and Niger and Somalia and Cuba and Burma? And why are we flying drones, armed drones in some cases, across the borders of at least nine states with whom we're not constitutionally at war and often in those states killing people? Well, there are a lot of reasons for it, but they're typical of empire. Fear of slippage is probably the first reason. What do I mean by that? We're defending the status quo. We're scared by a rat or a mouse or a peacock raising its head anywhere in the world when it looks like that head might be in some way, fashion or form opposed to the empire's interests. So we're, we're, we're fighting slippage. We're trying to maintain the status quo. Look over history, the last 5,000 years, that's one of the things empires in their dotage, so to speak, tend to do. We're spending all that money, as I just elaborated, on security contractors, on others than the all-volunteer force. There are more contractors in Afghanistan than there are soldiers or Marines. This is very lucrative for them. Look at the Levant, the Middle East. There are more contractors there than there are soldiers, airplanes, tanks, or anything else, and they're making a fortune. Laundering of criminal money for drugs that come back from all the war zones that we've ever been in from Vietnam to Afghanistan. Cocaine, heroin coming out of South America and so forth. The military participating in this unwinnable conflict, absolutely unwinnable conflict. Ask yourself why your military is participating in this conflict. When the center of gravity is Clausewitz, the great war theorist would postulate, the center of gravity, that which you should attack, that which the Schwerpunkt should hit, is not in Colombia or Afghanistan or any other country where they're raising poppies to make a living. It's in Europe and America where people are drinking down the drugs, cocaine, heroin, and so forth. That's whom you need to, quote, attack, unquote. Rehabilitation medical programs and so forth. That's where the money should be spent, not on the military, but it's very lucrative for the military to do these unwinnable things. And then there's the complex, all embedded in everything I've said so far. Lockheed Martin CEO made an incredible salary and income this last year, over 30 million, while her Lockheed floor employees were making five to 600 times less than she. And they just built this fabulous airplane costing over $2 trillion in its lifetime or more, a hundred million for each airplane and it won't even fly. Now, after years and years of research and work and operations, it won't even fly at a 60% fully mission capable rate. It's a disgusting waste of taxpayer money. Congress, Congress is in bed with everyone whom I've just described, and especially Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, and so forth. Tell Jim Inhofe from Oklahoma that he ever met a defense program he didn't want to increase the expenditures of, and he'll laugh at you. And that goes for almost all the committee chairmen and chairwomen who are in the defense business in the Congress. It is so lucrative. You will be a millionaire even as a representative before you leave, and you will certainly be a millionaire as a senator before you leave if you weren't before you got there. 
Congress is in bed with it. We can't even stop this unconscionable support of Saudi Arabia in the war in Yemen, where they're killing civilians, where they're blockading ports so they can't get food and water and so forth. We can't even stop our own support of that because the Congress is so politically and morally cowardly. It will not invoke the war powers. When some got together and made legislation and got it passed to do so, of course, Trump vetoed it, and there were enough abject cowards in both houses to not override that veto. U.S. Supreme Court, not only did the Roberts Court pass this Dred Scott-like decision of Citizens United and let billionaires buy politicians left and right, the Supreme Court and courts below it have increasingly violated a 200-year-old plus stricture on entering the national security field. Not only do they have the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court now, which is a farce, which essentially says whether or not a law enforcement entity or the NSA, for example, can spy on you um, or spy on foreigners that are suspected of doing this or doing that, but the more perfidious thing is you. Um, now they do things like national security letters. They do things like supporting the warfare state. They do things like uh, seeming to be in the old world of, oh, we won't interfere with that because that's political. But they do it based on abject political reasoning rather than legal reasoning. So we have three branches of government, three branches of government that are corrupted by this warfare state now and corrupted majorly in my view. One of the reasons we can't balance our government anymore is because everybody's looking that way and that's the only way they find concurrence. Let me just wrap up by saying that there is so much more to what I teach my students and so much more joy, if you will, in my heart when they leave because they're all over the government now. They're in Treasury, they're in, at state and the Foreign Service and the Civil Service, they're at transportation, they're in the Congress. One young lady sent me an email this morning, I was elated to learn she is now on the Infrastructure Committee under Representative DeFazio from Oregon, and she's an Oregonian too, so that means they probably are closer than I might think otherwise, and she's going to be responsible for much of the infrastructure implementation and legislation that causes it that President Biden is trying to get to. But even that is being corrupted. Even that is being corrupted. The shipbuilding budget, for example, was supposed to be a part of the infrastructure legislation. Well, that's fine and I cheered it because I thought it was for commercial shipping and we are very much a laggard in commercial shipping. Almost everyone in the world does better than we do in terms of commercial shipbuilding and commercial ship use and so forth. Well, I found out it's for private shipyards. What does that mean? Well, it means it's for Bath in Maine, for example. Well, who's Bath owned by? Grumman, you got it, Grumman. And who does Bath work for? DOD, it makes warships. It doesn't make commercial ships. We're trying right now to turn this around, trying to put enough pressure on the Congress and embarrass them enough to where maybe the Inhofs and others don't win. Maybe we can break some of that money out for what it was really intended for. This reminds us of the COVID-19 money that was allocated for DOD. And we started looking at it and saying, why does DOD need COVID-19 money? Is it because the sailors might catch the disease or whatever? That's okay. No. There was a little bit for that, a pittance, but most of it was to go to contractors like Lockheed Martin, like Raytheon, who were awash in money, polluted with money, so that they could uh, make sure their co that COVID-19 didn't disrupt their operations. <laughs> Fat chance of that, they're too polluted with money already. So this is where we are. This is where, and I haven't even talked about a lot of the dimensions of this, but I, I want to limit my time today so we have questions. This is where we are, though, in terms of the empire. And it's why I would conclude, coming back to my original script, that the expectation on my part, at least, is that this probably will be more cataclysmic than a mellow maturation. That is to say, we will be more like the Western empire of Rome 
than uh, Britain or someone else in the panoply of the last 5,000 5, years less noted who slipped from one partic particular position of power to a lesser position of power. Um, we might be the most cataclysmic in that 5,000 year history. We might be the one that causes more ripples, waves, indeed tsunamis than any empire that's ever collapsed before. It remains to be seen. I continue to work every day to prevent that as much as I possibly can and to alert people to the prospects and to alert people to the potential for a better outcome than a cataclysmic demise. So if I can entertain your questions now, I'd be happy to do so. Lawrence Wilkerson, what a great presentation, very clear and inclusive. And you must have been a breath of fresh air in the White House and places like, yeah, like that in your past life with your expose of the, the dark side, the, the other side of this. One of the things you didn't talk about, and I'd just like to question you a little bit on, is export sales of military hardware. And America at the moment sells to the world twice as much in this field of, of military sales as Russia does, for example, and 10 times as much as China puts out into the world. So I wondered what part of uh, this criticism of yours applies to, to that, where America is feeding these armaments out into countries such as Saudi Arabia and what they in turn are doing with it. Well, that's an excellent question. It has two dimensions in terms of the answer, at least for me, it does. Um, one is that, as Admiral Burke recently said on a webcast, he commands more naval forces than anybody on the face of the earth, <laughs> Atlantic fleet, Mediterranean fleet, Naples headquarters, and so forth. really a bright guy. And he said, we have allies. They don't. That's a very straightforward statement. Russia has no allies, none to speak of really. And it can talk about having this or that, Belarusia or whomever, but it really doesn't have any allies. And nor does China. As a matter of fact, China is becoming uh, in its own region, more worrisome and concern filled for allies, potential allies than it is like Vietnam, like Myanmar, than it is uh, a, a, an attraction. So that's one reason we have a lot of allies to sell guns to. Yes. But the, but the second reason is money, filthy lucre. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me tell you a conversation I just had with a parliamentarian from Norway. Right out of the blue, cold call. He'd seen some of the shows I'd done. And he said, look, um, is it true that if Norway, this is what we're being told by our leadership, that if Norway goes to Libya, it led the attacks in Libya, as a matter of fact, something I didn't know until he revealed it to me. They led the attacks from the air, um, exercise for their pilots, which they would never get otherwise. Um, he said, we're being told that our operations in Libya, our help in Afghanistan, our help in Iraq and so forth, is uh, to assure the United States will honor Article 5, were the Russians to start something hybrid warfare, little green men, for example, in Norway or Finland or Sweden. Is that something that's naive or not? And I answered him directly. I said, that's maximally naive. Do you think that the American people ultimately are going to support an exchange of nuclear weapons over little green men in Norway? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the concern that's being registered to me and not just from Oslo but from Berlin, from Paris, from Brussels and elsewhere. Um, and one of the reasons Bill Clinton, frankly, went ahead, just hammer to the wall with NATO expansion was he wanted to sell F-16s to Poland and to Hungary and to whomever would buy them because the F-16 line was getting cold and Lockheed Martin didn't want it to get cold. It wanted to keep it warm. And the way you keep those lines warm so the U.S. can buy them too at a reasonable price is you get allies to buy them. And that's the way you get allies to where they can't do anything without you too because you can always threaten to turn off the supply line and so forth. So it's got its 
you know, what I would say understandable end, and it's got its very insidious and pernicious end too. Yes, yes, yes. Not to mention the fact that we are the world's largest arms merchant and probably responsible for more deaths than anyone else in the world. As a result, yes. Yeah. And one of the questions that are already popping up has to do with um, where would you start if you wanted to cut the defense budget and the trillion dollar summary of all that as you have made, it's you're competing. I mean, they, they say that the social uh, contract, the social affairs side of government is over $2 trillion. And it looks like the total defense budget is getting very close to that. The, uh, you know, Medicare. That's a good question too. Um, we did a study, we, the Sustainable Defense Task Force, it was a combination of uh, Center for, uh, uh, what is it, the CPA, Center for, ha, my mind just went blank, uh, Center for Progress, Center for American Progress, something like that, and the institute that was seminal to it, the Institute for Policy Studies, Bill Hartung and others were involved, I was involved, and we pointed out, I think, very well, very documented, two years ago, how you could cut $100 billion every year for 10 years, a trillion total, and you'd make the military more effective, more efficient, not, not worse. But you'd have to do some things. You'd have to fall off these legacy systems. A Nimitz class or a later class, Ford class, whatever aircraft carrier now runs about 14 to $15 billion a piece. Those are going to the bottom. Were we to get into a real conflict, those would go to the bottom, two or three of them probably right away if we got into a fight in the South China Sea. That's 5,000 sailors per in the water. And oh, by the way, the battle group or strike group around that carrier now, as one admiral pointed out the other day and got reprimanded for it, doesn't have enough berths or space on its platforms to take those people out of the water, should they all survive or even half of them survive. So that's gonna be a shock to the American people. I recommend an article by Mike Sweeney. Mike said, what if we get in a war with China or Russia and we, we lose badly the initial battle, which we would in Ukraine, interior lines alone. Putin is operating on interior lines. We're operating on vast lines across the Atlantic. We would lose the first exchange with those 80,000 Russian troops marshaled on the Ukraine border. We'd probably lose in the South China Sea with China in the first exchanges. And Sweeney's point is, would we then recoup and revisit our situation, knowing full well that our economy and financial power and political power dwarfs Russia's and at least equals China's, we would eventually win. We would eventually win. No, he said, that's not America's way. We'll be so angry that we have lost the initial exchange, we'll go nuclear. Wow. Now there's a scenario for you. Wow. By wow. the way, in every war game I ever played in the military with Taiwan as the setting, we stopped it at the point where we both were attrited Navy and Air Force so badly that both sides were contemplating nuclear weapons. We stopped the war game. So that's very much in line with Mike's predictions. This is not something we want to happen. But Mike's article is very believable. Scary. <laughs> yes, yes. Scary. I hope it's scary. I hope a lot of Americans <laughs> oh, read it and get scared. I get scared, yes. <laughs> As a, there's a Joyce Lab Lanners out there who asks, if Biden were to try to reverse some of the militaristic trend, the budget, for example, would he or any other reformer be given uh, credit for this or would he lose votes or whatever? In the beginning, he would have to have incredible courage, political and moral courage. Um, I think he would have to be a different person altogether. I think a lot of people voted for Donald Trump because he thought, they thought he was that person. And a lot of them were disappointed. I know a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump voted for him because in their extended family, they had military members who had come home hurt or been killed or had traumatic brain injury or post-traumatic stress. And so they voted for him because in the run-up to the 16 election, he said he'd stop these endless stupid wars. And that's why they voted for him. So those 75 million Americans are not all certifiable. 
uh, they were looking for something different. And I think what I've just described to you is part of their inchoate understanding of what they're looking for. They need a, a new leadership. Um, I don't know that someone so steeped in the present situation as President Biden could, could do this, but he could certainly start it. And he could start it by getting his cabinet on his side. Um, people like Lloyd Austin on his side. You are brain dead in the Pentagon, my friend. You don't have to say it that directly. <laughs> but these legacy systems are not going, cyber warfare is probably going to eat our lunch. We won't even have to go to a battlefield. Look at what's just happened, what Russia is testing out. Um, we could be brought to our knees in our financial system, our energy distribution system, our transportation system, our water and sewer. I know, I helped study this right after 9-11, and we were scared to death what a single terrorist could do if he got a hold of a nodal map that showed him where these key points were, or the computers controlling them. Well, the GRU now, the Russian intelligence unit for whom I have a great deal of respect, even if they are a bunch of knaves, knows this. So I don't even think the warfare, the battlefield, if you will, is gonna be the same. I think these systems are gonna be sitting out there costing trillions of dollars, rotting as we take each other down through network computer warfare. Yeah. Uh, and they need to wake up to that. And if someone would and started retooling the Pentagon accordingly, we'd have a vastly reduced defense budget, as we point out in that study I told you about. A question from uh, Charlie Kimball is, uh, where should the public start today, <laughs> taking seriously all that you've said? What, what should we do? <laughs> That's an excellent question I get everywhere. I, I, I told some people in Minneapolis right before the pandemic hit and I was up there, I said, well, the first thing you should do is really study hard who you send to Congress. Yes. Mm -hmm. Study hard. And if there's no one there for you to vote for, go get someone. Prompt them. Do whatever you need to do. Work through your political action committees, whatever. Go out there and find someone, male or female. And I would, you know, I tend to say females these days because they seem to be better decision makers and advisors than males. Uh, but find someone and put them in Washington. Um, eventually, we will build enough people in Washington who care more about the nation than they do their own pocketbooks and their own ambition, and we'll change the picture. That's the long-term solution. Short-term solutions are, are, are several. Get involved, as you are. Get involved in making more Americans aware of the challenge, aware of the problems, aware of the dilemmas and get them to cast their votes and write letters and do, do things that you can do accordingly. We actually got that Yemen vote that was successful till Trump vetoed it with things like the Friends Committee for National Legislation, the Quakers, who lobby better than anyone I've ever seen. They bring 400 Quakers into Washington from all the states and say, you're from Oregon, go to Oregon. You're from Nevada, go to Nevada. You're, and they go, you can't refuse a constituent. Is it? And they hammer those people. Yes. That works, it gets things. We got the vote finally, it took two years, but we got the vote and it passed in both houses. The president vetoed it. Um, but that's the kind of action we have to take. We have to stop being apathetic. You know, Franklin supposedly in an apocryphal moment or not, walked uh, in front of the building where the constitution had just been uh, perfected. And some woman is supposedly asking him, uh, what happened? What happened, Mr. Franklin? And he said, well, a republic, if you can keep it. Well, I don't care whether he said that or not. It's very, <laughs> very apt. We yeah. haven't been keeping the republic very well. Mal, it's only fair. I've started taking uh, questions from the audience and you didn't get yours <laughs> if you're there. Turn your, turn your camera on. Oh, he's not even listening. <laughs> no, there he is. <laughs> yeah, put your sound on. <laughs> Where you're asleep. Now you're mute. The vagaries of Same Zoom. to you, lady. <laughs> you, did you wander off? <laughs> one, one observer has said that China is considerably behind us in military capability 
but they keep catching up quickly. A seven-fold increase in military spending in the past 20 years, more annual spending than Korea, Japan, Vietnam, and the Philippines combined, and backed up by a $12 trillion annual economy, much of which is going to the <laughs> military spending. My question is, this kind of information, which may or may not be correct, really drives a lot of support to the military industrial congressional complex. I wonder how you, how do you deal with that when we hear that from notable people? It does because it's exploited by those notable people and it's exploited without the full story. Um, I, you can't see this probably. This is a uh, binder and inside are pages with the Chinese at the top given to me by the vice president of the Central Party School, which is the agency in China for strategic thinking. It's called the Institute for International Strategic Studies, the party school of the Central Committee of the CPC, the Chinese Communist Party. I've been involved with China for a long time. China is Sun Tzu not Clausewitz. China is slow, soft power, roll up of an already collapsing empire that doesn't even know it's collapsing. That's China's objective. They do not want war. They're building their military essentially because the Politburo is now occupied by enough military influenced power. Indeed, they have a military industrial complex too, that in some ways is challenging people like Xi Jinping and Hu Jintao before him and others. People like Wang Yi, for example, who's one of the most accomplished diplomats in the world and now enjoys extra power in the Chinese apparatus because of that. Uh, put Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan to shame in Alaska recently, as did Sergei Lavrov, one of the most accomplished diplomats I've ever met. Powell and he used to talk on the cell phone all the time. They solved things on the cell phone. The NSA would tell them, oh, that's not secure. And Powell would say, so what? Um, that's how you do diplomacy. So what? You work with your, your fellow mates in the world, like Joska Fischer from Germany, for example, after Bush had told Schroeder to go F himself and ruin the transatlantic relationship. Yes, Bush came before Trump and did some of the same things. Um, Working diplomatically, economically, and financially, and by the way, China has surpassed the United States in the most important economic measurement, and that is purchasing power parity, and she'll pass us in every other measurement very soon. That doesn't mean anything unless we make it mean something, or unless we let the Chinese feel like they need to make it mean something. Tell me where China has 800 bases in the world. We do. Eight hundred bases all over the world. Tell me when China gets up in the morning and sees itself surrounded by Japan, by Korea, by the US 7th fleet, by all manner of other things, including now India, and we get up in the morning and see what? Two broad oceans, Mexico and Canada. Maybe Mexico has a drug threat or an immigration threat, a la climate change, watch that Southern border. In another 25 to 50 years, we're gonna have millions of people coming across that border. We're gonna put machine guns on it and we're gonna be killing them. Mark my words. That's what climate change is gonna to do to the global South, indeed is already doing to the global South. So we need to work together. The other day, a Naval War College seminar, webinar I'm listening to, and one of the most preeminent climatologists on the webinar says, quote, this is a direct quote, we may have already lost a battle we didn't even know we were in. She was referring to solar and solar associated power producing elements. And she was referring to China. That's what China is doing, tackling the real problems in the world, tackling the existential problems in the world. Are they a polluter? Absolutely. But look at where they started and look at where they are now and look at what they're doing now because they understand the problems and the dimension of those problems associated with this catastrophe called the climate crisis. They also understand the problems with nuclear weapons, but look why they just changed their Mao Zedong originated 
doctrine on nuclear weapons, which was, as Mao put it, essentially translating, uh, they are nothing. They do not mean a thing. They are useless, but we must have a few in order to deter those who have many. And then he went on to say, how about if we blow up Los Angeles and New York with two of ours? You can shoot them at us all day long. They were about 800 million at that time. Uh, we'll have 100 million left. That was Mao's philosophy. Well, the Chinese through this Central Party School are revisiting that. Why? Because they see us and the Russians unable to control the arms race. We've destroyed arms control. The only thing we've done, thank God, finally, was Biden went right into New Start and renewed it with Putin, which Putin had been hammering Trump to do for a year or two. That's the only thing we have now, though. And so the Chinese are building a new nuclear arsenal, one that can survive a first strike and strike back. Understandably so, given what we and Russia are doing. Why did we do this? The military industrial complex includes the nuclear weapons conflict uh, complex. And it also includes the nuclear waste removal complex. A billionaire out in Utah, I know, made all of his money off that complex. <laughs> okay, we've got lots of complexes running around and they're driving us to places we do not need to be going. And they're driving China and Russia to the same places. We need to be cooperating. The name of cooperation is diplomacy. And yet America has been reducing the budget, of course, of the State Department. And one of our speakers coming up this fall will be looking at their, you know, the ambassadors from the past view of what can be done with the State Department. And, and you've come from that more recently. What do you think? How, how do you get back to putting ambassadors out into the world? One of the first things we need to do, and I, I agree with Rex Tillerson on this, I agree with Colin Powell on this, I agree with probably Condi Rice on this, but none were able to affect it completely. And that is revitalize, revamp, and re-energize the Foreign Service. It is a bureaucrat bureaucratic, ah. poorly led, uh, dumbly led even organization. Let me give you one example. You've got an ambassador in Warsaw doing a bang up job, just doing a bang up job, two years there. Okay, he wants to go to Prague. Nope, come home to Washington. You gotta be reblued in Washingtonite, you know, parlance. No, I don't wanna come home to Washington. I'm in the foreign service. I wanna stay in Europe. No, nope, no. Nope. And if you do move him to another ambassadorship, guess where you move him? You move him to Tokyo <laughs> because, or not Tokyo, because that's always a political appointee, but you move him to Myanmar or Thailand or something because you want to diversify his experience. Hogwash. That's not how Sergei Lavrov grew up. That's not how Yoska Fisher grew up. That's not how Sergei Vieiro Melo, the brilliant Brazilian diplomat grew up. They grew up learning their trade. They grew up learning everything they needed to know about that trade. They didn't have to come back home to the capital to be reblued. You suspect them of being nativist to the point that they, you know, they're going to turn against the U.S. Come on, this is what your foreign service does. You need to do that. You need to revamp, revive, make it more. I hate to say this, make it more like the military. Make them go get a Ph.D. from Princeton. Give them two years off to go do that. The military does that all the time. Give them two years off to go get uh, uh, reblued in something else associated with diplomacy, not you know to come home and learn the bureaucrats so you can get promoted to assistant secretary of state for East Asia and the Pacific. You wanna be an ambassador. You wanna be a career ambassador. That's what we should do first. And then second, we should empower them. And that is as important as the first. And you empower them with money, but you also empower them with mission and support. Every ambassador, how many Americans know this, is commissioned by the president of the United States. They work for the president. They can avoid the secretary if they want to. They can go straight to the White House. Some do. Secretaries get annoyed, of course, but they can go straight to the White House if they want to. They are em empowered by the president of the United States. They work for the president of the United States. Secretary of State is just his intermediary, if you will, for foreign policy. Um, let's do that. 
let's have presidents like, for example, George H.W. Bush spent four or five hours a day on the telephone with Helmut Kohl in Berlin, with Francois Mitterrand in Paris, with John Major, Maggie Thatcher, and others in London. Uh, this is a man who knew about diplomacy. He couldn't get reelected. Maybe that's a problem too. <laughs> the American people don't appreciate foreign policy, but this is the kind of people we need. And we need a State Department that embodies all of that. Yes, one of the questions from outside is uh, going down the path we're going now, <laughs> given the power of the military complex, given the, the funding of the defense and other parts of it, you alluded earlier in your talk to a disaster down the road as this empire collapses. That's what they want to know. Is that coming in steps <laughs> slowly or is it? And you said it could be tomorrow or it could be whatever, 30, 30 years down the road. But did you want to come back to that for a moment? That's a question that would arise from time to time in seminars, both in public policy and national security affairs. Um, and I learned as much from my students as, as they ever learned from me, probably more. Um, the answer more often, and that was my technique to let them develop the answer rather than me preaching to them, that came back from my young people was, it's anybody's guess, but with climate change and to a slightly lesser extent, the nuclear arms race renewed now, perhaps there'll be enough concern in major capitals like the G20 capitals or the G7 or G8 capitals that eventually people will get, get the message. And, and at the same time, concern in the publics. For example, look at the concern right now about the absolute criminal activity of Netanyahu in Gaza and elsewhere in the Levant right now, in Israel and surrounding areas. Um, are the American people just going to take this forever? Or are they suddenly going to wake up one day and say, why are we sending the equivalent of $12,000 per Israeli citizen every year to Israel when all they do with that money is kill people and or sell weapons to other countries, some of whom are our enemies, and or consolidate their illegal occupation of the West Bank portions of Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, and the refugee camp in Gaza. Why are we doing this? Jewish Americans are awakening even now. Polls show 70% of them and higher percentages if they're under 40 now despise Netanyahu, now are working to do something to prevent Netanyahu's government from continuing and to put him in jail, frankly. And a lot of this is happening right now is happening just because of that. He wants to stay in power and he wants to stay out of jail. So the best way to do that is put Israel in peril. Therefore, he has to stay around. This is unconscionable. And yet we are behind it. Gideon Levy at Haaret said the other day, those bombs falling on those children in Gaza were bought at Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. Those F-16s were bought at Lockheed Martin. He's right. He's absolutely right. I don't know what it'll take to awaken the American people in a significant sort of way to these sort of crimes in their names, but I think it's going to happen eventually. When that happens, is it a revolution in the streets or is it more like America in the past where we just move dynamically to change things? Um, I'm hearing right now from Westerners, for example, in my party, that they are but pick your capital, Boise, uh, wherever, whatever capital you want to pick, they're disgusted with the Republicans. They're disgusted, these are young Republicans. They're disgusted with them because of clean water and their uh, opposition there to clean air and their opposition there to, think of Idaho for a moment. That's their whole uh, economy out there basically is, is hunting and fishing and, and uh, clean water and rivers and so forth. Um, they want to kick the Republicans out in Boise. We need more of that. We need more of that all across the country. There are some hundred Republicans right now, both in office and out, who are considering seriously and have had a couple of meetings forming a third party. That's a death knell for the Republican party and they know that, but they're willing to do that and bet on time to perfect their party rather than the current party. So there are things happening. 
they're, they're slow in gestating. They're even slower in coming to fruition if they do, but they are happening. Um, will that be in time? Will it be in time to prevent something really catastrophic from happening, like I intimated before, a nuclear exchange, for example? And then all bets are off. All bets are off. Um, I don't know. I can't answer that question. I can only teach students who will grow up and go into positions in government and say, we're here now and we're taking over. <laughs> and we don't want that to happen. <laughs> here is a statement an incredibly honest dissertation, they're talking about you, <laughs> an explanation of where we are heading. And at that, on that note, I would like to thank you, Lawrence Wilkerson, for participating in our program today and being so honest and forthright with us as your audience. And we do take to heart a lot of the things that you're saying and you've given us some ideas of where we, the public, can go from here. So with my thanks and the thanks of all the people out there listening and watching you, thank you for agreeing to come. We appreciated a week ago when you'd rather go fishing than to be with us. But here you are, you're with us, and we love you dearly for being here. And thank you again. And I turn you over to Mel. <laughs> let me just let, let me make one response. I had to take my son-in-law. He's a Montgomery County policeman of 25 years, and he is close to being suicidal. Ah. It's just horrible what's happened to his police department. And it's all part of this warp and woof of empire collapsing. You know, we can't even execute law enforcement in a meaningful way anymore. His department's falling apart. 50% of the police have already left. And he is on, he's at wit's end. And he's a good policeman. He's a community-based, I am here to protect you, policeman. I will pull my weapon out only under maximum duress and only if I'm defending you. That's the kind of policeman he is. And he is, you know, as I said, he's at his wit's end. I had to get him out somewhere so he could have something he's a, he's different. A, could catch a fish. <laughs> yeah. Now, over the weekend, my brother-in-law was here from North Carolina, and I told him that you were going fishing, and he said, that's the right choice. He didn't know anything about the background. He said it was a right choice under any condition. Many thanks to our distinguished guest, Lawrence Wilkinson. Thanks also to Don, today's recruiter and moderator, to Joan Kuhn and her colleagues from the Chappaqua Library, to Carrie Krams from Newcastle Media, uh, who, and all of you who've joined us today and throughout the spring series, uh, wherever you are. We don't see you, but we know you're out there. If you have family or friends who would like to join us, please email Joan Kuhn, okay, K U H N at WLSmail.org, so we may add you to our newsletter and invitation list. Until we meet again on September the 13th, please be safe. Thank you. <laughs>